Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for all that you give us, especially the gift of Jesus. As our readings in church reminded us today, there are a lot of things that we fail to do as your people. We try and we have been given the aid of their Holy Spirit, but even still sometimes our sinful flesh and the devil wins out. But not so with Jesus. He lived the perfect life facing all the temptations that we face, being tested in every way. And now because of his death on the cross in obedience to your will, we have his perfection. We thank you, Lord, for that and that hope that comes from believing in Jesus. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we are uh, doing the fourth and fifth commandments today, but I do have, uh, I want to do a little review of commandment three. So we talked a fair bit of our class last week about um, that it's still worth coming to church on Sunday morning, even if you're reading the Bible regularly at home with your family or in groups among your friends, because something special happens on Sunday, right? Um, and that that tradition is born out through the Christian church rooted in the Sabbath day and the understanding of the rest. And where did that originally come from? Remember we talked about that last week? Creation, right? It goes all the way back to the beginning when God set apart that day as holy and he rests from the work of creating the world, okay? Um, and so that's born out through the Jewish law in the Old Testament and the, and the temple rituals. And then once Jesus comes along, we still observe the Sabbath, but not in the same way. Uh, but it's still it's still set apart. Uh, that's what holy means, to be set apart. So it's still a holy day for us. It's set apart for the worship of God and the coming together of the body of Christ. And for us, one of the things I wanted to clarify is a lot of times when we talk about worshiping God, what usually comes to mind is what? When we say worship God. Sunday morning. And what particularly about Sunday morning is worshiping God? Going to church. Going to church, all right. What do you do when you get there? Pray. Pray, Pray and sing, right? So the point that I was, I was getting at is that when we think about worshiping God, we usually think about the stuff that we do in that context. We often don't think about, and this is the truly restful aspect of Sunday morning, the work that's being done to us and for us by God. That's part of our worship of God is being still, being aware and listening, <clears throat> excuse me, and listening for what God has to say and what he's doing to and for us. Okay? So the, the drama of the, the worship service is this back and forth. And it really perfectly highlights our relationship with God and Jesus, right? It's, it's the singing of prayer and praise in response to the works of grace and mercy that God does on our behalf. And so there are parts of the service where we're actively involved. And then there are parts of the service where we're just, our, our job is to remain still and to receive what God is giving to us, right? Um, and so that is sort of the, the drama that we highlighted there. And I think it highlights the uniqueness of what is being done on Sunday morning is the gifts that God is bringing okay? uh, through his word that's not only read, but spoken through the office of the pastor, as well as the reception of communion. The other, the other thing we highlighted was Usually when we're thinking about the way we do those things, we only think in terms of like a single life, you know, 60 to 80 years. But what does God have to think in terms of? Eternity, Eternity right? And so while we may be able to get away with every once in a while doing our own thing, if we draw that out over not only one lifetime, but multiple lifetimes and generations, where do you think the church would be today if everybody was like, well, I experienced God best in nature, and I like doing my own prayers, my own thing. None of us would probably be in church in 2021, right? So there's a, a balance of movement by the Spirit and order instituted by God for our benefit, right? Um, so that is one of the benefits and reasons of gathering together on Sunday morning. Because how many of you occasionally when you come on Sunday, or maybe more than occasionally, for being honest, is like, I need to go to church because this week was a 
bummer, right? You got, you got here and you're just feeling terrible about yourself because the law of God, which is written on your heart, was just continually showing you a mirror that you tried to smash a bunch, a bunch, a bunch, and it just kept coming back. And then you came to church because you needed those gifts that God has given you, right? You needed to be among the body of Christ who helped share those burdens and the joys, right? So, so that was another element that we talked about in highlighting. Now, I think we're going to get into our new material now, which is the last question we're going to talk about with Commandment 3 at the top of your handout. And I think it's pretty well related to the question, question 52 in red on the bottom of page 78 in your small catechism. Why is it vital for us to gather together with fellow Christians in public worship? And I wanted to have a discussion about this in the context of COVID and the digital age. Okay. Um, because... Our current environment sort of prompted us to start asking some questions that we probably haven't asked in a long time. Like if I find myself going to church only online, what does that mean? I've never had to think about that before. Uh, and it was the same for the pastors in a lot of cases, by the way. They're thinking, what does this mean? What does it mean for community? What does it mean for, like, how long is that okay? Because if I were to tell you right now, Hey, by the way, we just found out that you're going to have to go to worship online for the next 10 years. Uh, you can almost, the response would be, oh. <laughs> and in most cases, even now at this point, there are lots of people that are going to different churches because they're actually getting together in person. Okay? And that's not just because they're impatient or they're, they're grumpy or whatever. There's a reason behind that, and we have to seriously think about that, right? So I wanted to have this sort of discussion about a question about gathering for worship in the context of that we are living in right now, COVID, right? There are members of this church that maybe attend every week online that I have not met, and I've been here for almost three months now, right? So uh, what does that mean for our life together in Christ, and what does that mean for me as a pastor offering them spiritual care? So one of my instincts, which is why I did this almost immediately, is they need the gifts that are offered on Sunday that they can't get online. So what gift would that be? Holy communion. communion, right? Um, because part of communion, part of our teaching and doctrine of communion is that gathering together. But then that started a whole bunch of conversations about, well, are we technically gathering together online? Is that is that also gathering together? Um, and that was a difficult issue to, to figure out, and there's still some disagreement on it. Because uh, Lutherans, what we typically do is we don't like to infer meaning about things that isn't explicitly in Scripture. Right? So um, why, don't, why don't we celebrate communion with potato chips and grape soda? Yeah, why don't we? Yeah, they would taste, <laughs> I think most people say they would taste better. <laughs> we might get more people to come to our church if we did that. Why don't we do that? Because we have to have the body and the blood of Christ and have to be consecrated. Well, yeah, but I can consecrate grape soda and potato chips, but it's, right? It's the body and the blood of Christ. Well, the but the bread and wine by itself isn't. It's it's the the act of the sacrament that makes it the body and blood. So couldn't that also happen with potato chips and grape juice or grape soda? Because we are doing this in remembrance of him who gave of his body and of his blood, and the elements at the meal were bread and wine. Ah, okay. So at first I thought you were gonna give me like a really nice explanation that was not quite related, but then you got it. Right? <laughs> that that's what Jesus did. Right. So as far as I know, my goal in the celebration of the sacrament is to do everything that he did as close as I possibly can. Because I don't necessarily know the significance of all the details, right? So that was a that was a related topic to this discussion of communion during the time of COVID. Could you make a reasonable sounding argument that when you're online, you're together? Yeah, you can. But the concern is, like Jesus and all of his disciples weren't little boxes on a screen when they celebrated the sacrament. So is that significant or not? 
right? Uh, and there's disagreement about that. I think for the most part in the LCMS, most people, because I think of our cautious, scripturally oriented nature, are saying in order, because we don't know, therefore we should do it as close as possible to what is in the scriptures, right? So when I first got here, in order to maintain my faithful understanding of that, I said, I'll bring it to you. Even if it's, I'll set it on your porch railing and I run out to the sidewalk and we talk across your yard. I don't care, right? Because it's the gathering of Christians to receive the gift of God, which is the important thing. So I don't mind doing something weird or being looking foolish in order to accomplish that, right? Um, so, so what do you guys think? In, in the context of COVID, what constitutes gathering together? Or how should we interpret that dynamic? Not just with communion, but in general. Huh? Where two or more are gathered. Where two or more are gathered. So the question is, what constitutes gathered? What constitutes gathered? If I'm in a Zoom call with you, are we gathered? Well, maybe within communication, as long as we can communicate. Okay, so gathered in the sense of communicate. Okay. What else? It's nice we can do that, but you miss the seeing each other and talking. Okay. You can talk to them, but it's not the same. So would, would anybody say that the fact that uh, people can join us online now isn't a blessing? Oh, no. We pretty much all agree that it is, right? Yeah. It is a blessing, yeah. right? Now, let's say um, you wake up Sunday morning and you just feel like you got hit by a truck. You just feel awful, right? Maybe you're nauseous, you have an awful headache, or whatever it is, and, and you decide that it's for the good of yourself and others, you shouldn't go to church that day. Well, now you have the option that you can go to church on your couch and you can moan and groan and be in your sweatpants all you want. You're not going to bother anyone. That's a great thing, right? Or maybe in the context of family, you're trying to wrangle all your kids to go to church and it's just a nightmare of the morning, right? Multiple accidents, some not staying in diapers and just craziness. And you know that if you go to church, you're going to be like 35 minutes late. And you don't want to be that family walking in every turns and stares. You wonders why you're 35 minutes late. And so most families just decide, I won't go today. But now they can watch online. But what Janet said, I think, also highlights another aspect that most people agree on, including those who are watching online, that something's missing. So while it is a blessing and it provides us flexibility and options, the natural reaction, if I told you, like, Hey, Pete, hey, Barb, hey, Bob, you're going to have to watch service online for the next 10 years. I think most Christians will be like, I'll risk the death at some point, right? Um, because there is a recognition that while it is a blessing, it falls short in certain aspects, which makes that, that's what makes that difficult, right? So the question is, where as, as the church, where do we encourage people in the freedom of the gospel to be like, look, if you're at risk in this particular case because of COVID, if you're particularly at risk, stay home. And you're still able to hear God's word and you're still a part of our congregation, you know, in a sense, just as much as if you were here physically. But as a pastor, I'm always thinking in terms of spiritual care. So if I know somebody who normally is here every week hasn't been here in person for like eight months, what should my thought be? Immediately, you give them a call. Yeah, I should give them a call because I should see, how are you doing? I know you can come online and stuff like that, which is great, but there's also something missing. Personal. Yeah, right. And you, and there are other ways that you're disconnected that you normally would be either, right? How many of you find out things about people you care about here when you see them on Sunday morning, right? And if you don't see them regularly on Sunday morning, they could have a family member die. They could be in the hospital and out of the hospital three times. You had no idea. And how do you feel when you find that out four months later? Usually not great. Right? You feel like, oh my gosh, I let them down as their brother or sister in Christ because I had no clue that was going on. Yeah. And here we have another, you know, problem along with it. A significant number of the extremely active, uh, involved people are no longer coming to church. Period. And. With a, you know, being a brand new pastor here, 
that's really tough because you don't know who they are and things like that. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was just that's what I was just saying. Like, you know, somebody could have been here literally every week online since I've I've come here, mm -hmm. and I still haven't met them. Right. And uh, pastor. Yeah. Um, one thing that we also want to, to be aware of, while I totally agree being in person is the best choice because of the interpersonal relationships and, 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 and feeding and encouraging one another, one of the things that this um, online scenario that we've developed has, one of the blessings that we've received is how many people who haven't been able to come to church because they were shut-ins or whatnot, and now get to see our church family and they have it in years. Right, yeah, exactly, right? And, and you know, so not only is it a blessing in the immediate sense of what we're dealing with, but it's a blessing in other ways, which is exactly right. And so it's important when you're going through a situation like this, and I'm, I'm putting this in the third commandment context because it most directly impacted the attendance of your Sabbath day worship, that you acknowledge both sides of those conundrums, right? Because I want to be aware enough, not only myself, but the other leaders in the congregation, in order to offer spiritual care for people who are in potential spiritual danger because they're missing things that church normally provides them. But also, I don't want to unduly burden their conscience by making it seem like that it's not a great thing in many ways that allows them to be a part of this um, when they otherwise wouldn't be able to at all. Right? Uh, and then on top of that, in the middle, there's, I think there's a spot for certain things like communion where, given the situation, here are the adjustments I need to make in order so that you receive this gift. Right? That's my job. I mean, God wants this gift to you, and I have to give him an account if you don't get it. Right? And that account would involve me basically, if, I, if, it's, my, if it's because of me that you're not getting it, then I have to give an account for that. So that's why I'm, I'm going to go out of my way in this sort of environment where I think that's something when you're online that you're missing. Right? Um, so I'm going to make it to where because of the situation and because there really isn't anything wrong with just worshiping online for now, especially if I can bring in the other blessings in a, in a safe way for you. Does that make sense? Yeah, Bob. I think the, what really touched me was and again, you are here now, and that's wonderful. But even before that, I love the heart of the elders and, and everybody that we, we try to present that communion to them, but we knew that it was important. And, that, and, yeah. and we had other options. If you're making, you know, when we now that you're here, you're even making them better options. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, too, the, the, uh, um, one of the ways the Lord uses situations like this is like, you know, sort of in the line of absence makes the heart grow fonder. And that maybe I was, you know, and this was certainly me. I was taking for granted the fact that I went to church every Sunday and in my old call, we did communion every week. So people are, you're just like, it's part of your, your worship rhythm, you know, in a great way. But then all of a sudden COVID hits and we basically pretty much completely shut down for like a month and a half. And then all of a sudden, there's all these things coming up in my life where I was like, oh, man, this is why I was at church. Or this was, you know, where I was supported at church in a way that I'm not now. And I didn't even realize it because I just took it for granted until I don't have it anymore. Or I don't have the same sort of access to it. Anymore, right. And that's sort of why it prompted all these discussions about things like communion. Because when was the last time you really seriously thought about what communion is, what it's for, and, and in the context of COVID then, what lengths I should go to receive it? Right, so that there's a reason it prompted all those sorts of discussion is that all of a sudden the church was like, wait a minute, this stuff's really important. And now we have like a, a, a wrench in the gears on how we normally build them out, which is always gonna prompt sort of an introspective questioning of, Okay, is this an appropriate way to do it and why? Is this inappropriate and why? Uh, what's really going on here and those sorts of things. So, so I just wanted to kind of bounce that around a little bit with you guys, just as a way of, of triggering thoughts about, is it okay to worship online for now? Yes. Do most people want to do that for 10 years? No. Why? 
right? And, and sort of understanding that balance where uh, I think on your handout, I put, yeah, I put good, better, and best, right? So if you ever heard the saying, don't let, don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good, right? What's the perfect ideal situation? That we're all be able to gather in person and celebrate communion in person and share the greeting of peace where we can actually like touch each other and hug each other and all that good stuff. But right now we can't do that, right? And in many cases, it's for the sake of the conscience of the brother or sister in faith. So don't let the good or don't let the perfect become the enemy of the good, right? Um, does that make sense to everybody? So I hope that this was an encouraging discussion for those of you who are online, uh, that there is nothing wrong with doing that, but also um, sort of an encouragement as well to not just rely on those things, right? That, because um, I think that's what we often end up doing is we pit those things against each other when they're not really against each other. They're in the same continuum, just one's not as ideal as the other. So then how do we adjust our situation in order to accomplish what we would normally do in this way in multiple ways now because we have to. Any other thoughts to share on that particular topic before we go to commandment number four? Okay. Fourth commandment, page 81 in your small catechism. Um, let's see. Sally, can you read that for us? The box part, honor your father and your mother. We should fear and love God so that we may not despise or anger our parents and other authorities, but honor them, serve and obey them, love and cherish them. All right. Any parents out there, make sure you know this commandment. It's a good one to know, right? You can, you can literally say, God said, <laughs> honor your father and your mother, right? Uh, and I included an extra promise on there. This was this comes up somewhere else in Scripture in the New Testament, um, because Paul highlights that this is the first commandment given that has a promise that is attached to it. And this was when I was growing up and we did family devotions. We would recite the commandments together, and sometimes it would be like my mom and dad would do the odd commandments, and the kids would do the evens, or the boys and girls, or whatever. And so when we'd say this one, he'd say, "Honor your father and your mother, that it may be well with you, that you may live long on the earth." And that was a that's in the New Testament, but it's hearkening back to the promise in Exodus 20 that you'll live long in the land uh, that God has given you. Okay. Um, so how does this commandment give a special honor and distinction to parenthood? Yeah. I think it would be I don't know whether it's implied or explicit, but Indicate that God that God has put parents in their positions, and and that parents essentially exercise their authority as something that's been ordained by God. Okay, so um, the answer was that God is the God has placed parents in their position and given them their authority in order to carry out their work on His behalf. Right. Um, so the phrase that I like to describe that reality that's correct is that you're the primary representatives of God on earth for your children. Let that sink in for a moment. Both the good and the potentially scary realities that that brings with it, okay? Um, and what that means is that your authority is derived from God within the vocation of being a father or a mother. And you are the number one relationship with those children spiritually, whether you want to be or not. There's a reason that it's the first commandment on the second table, right? The second table of the Ten Commandments relates to our relationship with other people. What do you think a two-year-old primary relationship with other people is? His parents, right? Um, so, when you're two years old, hopefully, you don't have to worry too much about stealing and murdering and uh, fornication, okay? But you are very concerned with honoring your parents, right, and that, and that relationship there. 
being in right understanding. Okay. Um, so, how does it make you feel to know that your God's represented on earth to your kids? I have a mask on, but I'm smiling as I ask that question. It's a daunting responsibility. It's a daunting responsibility, yeah. So that there's there's a bit of like holy awe of like, oh my goodness. Like really? That that's my job? Yeah. Yeah. What's what what also comes along with that? It is a blessing. In what way? Think of that, think of that term God's representative. What does that mean? You have, to, you have to follow what he wants you to do. Okay. Discipline. Discipline. Okay. All of that stuff is according to whom? Is it according to you? No, right? So the comfort and the blessing is that as a representative of God, you don't have to come up with a bunch of unique and new ideas. Right? You're, you're being a father or mother in the way that he's prescribed that vocation to be. In the same that while it is a daunting thing for me as a pastor to realize how much my words matter to other people, it's also a comfort because I'm not speaking here on my own authority. I'm, I'm relaying information to you from God right? through the study of his word. That's my job. So it isn't my job to speak on my authority to say, well, you know, personally, I think this is a really good idea. We should do this, this, and this. Like you don't really ever hear me say that in a sermon. What I say in a sermon is, here's what God is teaching us through what we heard read today. And here's what God is saying about, about this particular issue. Yeah, Cooper. Oh, you can see from there. That's great. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I just wanted to say one thing is that we should be encouraged by the fact that we do have a lot of influence over our children, at least when they're young, right? And that, you know, that's really unique because it. it it's taken me a long time to appreciate how little influence I have over most people in, in my life, you know, and, and it could be brothers or, or, you know, extended family or friends, you know, and we, we might at some time think, oh, I'm going to convince them of this, right? Like I, um, it's easy to think that, but with our children, especially young children, they really do look up to us. And so it is certainly that obligation, but it's, it's, it's positive because we, we have, they'll listen to us much more than most people in, in their life, at least at this age. Right. Yeah. Very, like one of the things Cooper was saying is that the influence that you have shouldn't necessarily only be seen as daunting, but it's also seen as a blessing, right? That you have the opportunity to influence your children um, through sharing the gifts of God through word with them. And the other thing that was on my mind, Pastor, when you were talking about the relationship that this kind of um, speaks to in, in terms of us and God, you know, we are children of God. And, um, you know, our work here on this world is to serve and do God's, do God's work. And I think that as parents, um, we are essentially, uh, you know, take, we take on that authority figure just as God takes on the authority figure for us. So we're essentially equipping our children um, to kind of do, do the work our work, which is our, if our work is God's work, then we're equipping our children to also do God's work. So um, yeah, there's that great, you know, positive there as well. Right. That, that, uh, that blessed chain of command, right? That, uh, that the, the one who's really an authority, authority I'm merely reflecting and, and sort of uh, re, recasting for you is not my own, but God's. Right? Um, which is all, whenever it's something relies on God, that should always be a comfort to you. Uh, yeah, Kristen. Yeah, um, just a little antidote. Um, Mike probably doesn't remember this, but when our oldest, Claire, was um, maybe five, old enough to read, um, we had a little, a kid's table in our kitchen um, with kids sized, you know, chairs. And I posted the Ten Commandments above it, um, and I, I, you know, it was all about law um, at the time. I wanted Claire to know the law, the commandments, 
And so it was a posted above the table where she ate at. And um, later in life, as, as they have grown, um, it's more about grace and, um, and not my daughter, Grace, but about <laughs> you know, Grace. Um, and just, I see in them that what the influence was as a young child, and yes, we go to church on Sunday morning, um, you know, they have evolved into, I, I become surprised at what they remember and the influence they had by going to church and learning the gospel. Um, it, it is comforting to know that, you know, they, they did listen. Um, and I think that's not just with children, but with others in life that you never know what Christian influence you're gonna have on somebody's life at some time in the future. Um, but I've seen it in my children, but. Um, that's that's and, really good because it also highlights that not only are you not alone in this task in, with regards to like the congregation and the pastor uh, and their Sunday school teacher and all of that, but you're also not alone in this task with regards to the Holy Spirit. Um, and so, like something that you say that you think is totally insignificant may be one of those things that when you're talking to your kid when they're 18 or 20 years old, that really sticks in their head and you're thinking, really? That's that's the thing? You know, but that you never know how the Holy Spirit is going to work through what people say. I mean, I, I maybe mentioned this already here, but I also have just like, um, there have been times where I've I've been shaking people's hand at the end of the service and they say, Pastor, that sermon was so great. Thank you for saying this. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't remember saying that. Right? And when that, you know, well, I have to clarify, when it's in line with the scriptures, that's the Holy Spirit at work, right? Because the Holy Spirit intimately knows the situation of everyone who's sitting there in a way that I cannot. I know some things about some people, but not everything. And so, the Holy Spirit does the same thing in the context of your family relationship when, you're, when your parents talk to your children. The Holy Spirit knows, even, even though parents know their children intimately, more intimately than any other human relationship, God knows them even better. Right? And so the fact that the important task of the growth and creation of their faith is in his hands is of an immense comfort. Rob has been very patiently waiting. Yeah, that commandment can also be very grievous when your child becomes an adult and is an ardent atheist. Yeah, so, okay, so the point that, uh, that Rob made is that the commandment can become something that grieves you when your children, if they grow up and they're, and they're ardently against the faith. Uh, and I actually, um, when I was doing family ministry at my previous call, one of the things that I wanted to do was come up with really a, a, an in-depth biblical study on what does the Bible really say about the passing on of the faith? Who does it and how does it occur? And then what does the Bible say about when your kids become adults, what does that mean? Right? And how does that affect that process? And I found something extremely interesting. Um, usually what starts that discussion for me is I'll be talking to a parent and they'll tell me, oh, I want my kids to have a really great relationship with you and come talk to you about stuff. And I'm like, that would be great, but you know what I'm going to do if they come talk to me about something serious? The first thing I'm going to do is encourage them to talk to you about it and bring you into the discussion, right? Because even if they really like me, I'm a less significant person to them personally, just by default, right? Um, and so the Bible, I always will tell them, find a verse in the Bible that tells me that the pastor teaches the faith to the children. I still haven't found it. There isn't one. Right? The Bible does describe that task in the context of a vocational calling from God to parents. But this is where it got interesting for me. The Bible also specifically avoids ascribing guilt to parents for non-believing adult children. Never once does it do that. Right? And there's a reason for that. And it's the reason that, that Kristen's comment brought up is that your job as a parent in the context of your vocation is to obey God by sharing the gifts as often as possible, right? The word and sacraments. So that 
That involves reading the Bible together at home and talking about faith. It involves bringing them to church so they can receive the sacraments, they're baptized, and that they receive the body and blood. But, just like Paul says in the New Testament, who's responsible for the growth of faith? Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Okay. And so, in the context you're describing, then, has your vocational responsibility as a parent actually changed at all? It hasn't, right? You're still to obey God by lifting them up in prayer as often as you're able to share the gifts of God with them, trusting that the Holy Spirit is the one who creates the growth, right? I had a, a Bible study that I led with a guy, uh, and he was talking about his father. His father was not a believer and didn't become a believer until about a month before he died. And one of the things that he lamented, which I felt was super relatable, was was like, dear God, why was it not the third time or the hundred and third time? Why wasn't it before the 3,475th time that I shared the gospel with my father that he believed? It would have saved him a lot of heartache, would have saved me a lot of heartache. Why did it take that long? And if you're a student of the Old Testament, that sounds a lot like a guy named Job, right? And what was God's answer to Job? Where were you when I laid down the corners of the earth? Yeah, right? Go out and change the mind of the sinner and then come back and we'll talk. And where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? In other words, what is he saying? He's saying, I'm God. Trust in me. Right? I'm God. You're not God. Trust in me. Right? Um, and that's difficult. I'm not saying, I'm, you know, in, in the context of a classroom discussion, it's easy to say that. I'm not saying it's an easy thing to do. Right? Um, I went to a conference. Gosh, my sense of time was all whacked out because of COVID. I think it was the fall before COVID. So not last fall, but the fall before. So what is that, 2019? Um, went to a, a conference in Florida, the Deuteronomy 6 conference. It's a family ministry conference. And one of the presenters... So I, I like sharing the story because it's about like the worst nightmare for a parent, I think, that you could possibly come up with, okay? Um, one of the presenters was, uh, he, re he recounted his story in his presentation. And the story is about his mother, who was constant in prayer for like something like 15 years. And her son went off to school to become a dentist, ended up losing his faith. He dropped out of dentistry school um, he came out as homosexual, and he became like a drug overlord in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay, and most of the stuff, most of the details, the, the parents didn't know. They knew like the general stuff, but they didn't know the details. So he was recounting this whole journey that he went on. Uh, and he, you know, wakes up one morning. There's a knock at his door, and he opens the door, and it's a SWAT team with drug, drug dogs, and he ends up going to jail, federal prison, and in federal prison. Was the first time he called his mom in years. Right. So imagine yourself in that situation and just, and you've been praying, she's been praying the whole time. And one of the points that was made in there was particularly powerful to me that the husband shared that at, one, at some point her prayer changed about her child. Her prayer used to be like, bring him back to me, Lord, uh, bring him back to you. But after a while, she added this phrase no matter what it takes, okay? So obviously when she added that, she wasn't envisioning arrest and federal prison and all that stuff. But no matter what it takes, do you think that she regrets that trajectory now that he's returned to her in faith? Not one bit, right? So that is, that's, the, that's the task, right? That's the vocational task of a, of a parent in that context, right? Is, you're lifting them up to the one who can actually do something about the situation. Right. And there's and it's not an accident that at times you feel helpless, right? That's the law coming in and saying, hey, look, you're relying on yourself and your own words and your own argumentation and your own whatever. That's not going to do it. You need to rely on me. Right? So return to me in prayer. Lift up your son or daughter, niece, nephew, whoever in prayer and trust in me. Okay. Um, so but yeah, so the, the influence you have is also a blessing, right? Um, so a lot of what 
I will do with youth and family ministry here, uh, what I've done in the past, is through that, that understanding that lens, right? That whether you participate or not, de facto, you're going to have more influence on your children than you. Okay. Um, and part of that is because you're always teaching spiritual things to your kids. Always. Even when you're doing things that you don't think have anything to do with faith. Okay. Um, so I did a Bible study, and I may do it here at some point, um, where I, the title of it was like, what you think you're teaching what you're teaching when you don't think you're teaching. And it was just a case study Bible study. So I came up with really common examples of, of everyday family life stuff, right? Mom and dad disagree in front of each other or disagree with each other in front of their kids. How many times does that happen before you guys? You disagreed with each other in front of your kids, right? Um, or your kids talk back to you in public. What do you do? Right? Or uh, Joey punched Jimmy in the face. What do you do, right? Yeah, right. So I mean, I have a brother. Uh, I I hit him a couple of times. He probably would say more, um, right? And I definitely talk back to my parents. I mean, these are things that people relate to because they happen a lot, right? And they happen a lot not because you're a horrible family, but because you're a family of redeemed sinners. Right? That's just the way it works. Okay. But the the necessary step for the Christian family after those events occur is understanding. They have an intimate connection with the life of faith, right? Because you have an opportunity to give your kids a lived experience of the stuff they only just hear about here at church. Like they understand if you ask your kids, what's forgiveness? They can probably tell you, right? They can probably tell you what that is. But that means less to them than actually experiencing it or watching it happen. So let's say mom and dad came up with a plan for inviting friends over after school. Well, you have to get your homework done. Well, dad was in a hurry and he was rushed by work stuff. And his daughter comes up and says, dad, can I have some friends over? And he says, sure. Well, then mom comes home and realizes that her son or daughter has not done her homework. You have to have friends over. This isn't what we agreed to. And so the mom has to be the bad guy and tell the friend, I'm sorry, you have to go home. Uh, we, you know, so-and-so needs to do their homework. Maybe, maybe later or a different day. Right. And then how does mom feel? Well, she's probably upset that she has to be the bad guy because she talked about this with her husband and he just totally forgot, right? So what needs to happen? We'll just do this one. What needs to happen? Communication. What sort of communication? Did somebody do something wrong? Yeah. Who? The dad did, right? Well, there's more than one, right? The dad did, and who else? The kid, the kid right? Because the kid asked a question that they already knew the answer to. Yeah. Um, but the dad, right? So what, is the, what should the dad do then? Apologize. Apologize. In what context? So remember, this disagreement was public in front of their children. <laughs> public. Yeah. Publicly. Yeah. He has to model and show that apology in front of the kids. Then what does the wife have to do? <laughs> if she says, I told you so, then she's got to apologize, right? You start, this nasty, you start this nasty cycle that never ends, right? What, is, what does she have to do? She accepts apology and offers forgiveness, right? What just happened? She, she says, that's okay, I'm used to it. <laughs> Yeah. What does that exchange teach the children that are watching? That, that forgiveness is a real thing because I just watched it happen. And they need to be honest when they make a mistake. Ah, oh, they need to be honest when they make a mistake. And it's key to getting people to be honest when they admit mistakes. It's key to get them to believe that when they do that, they're going to be forgiven. Okay? Because you can. You can try and tell your children, or I, as a youth pastor, can I, I can tell, until I'm blue in the face, I can tell high schoolers, you can come and talk to me about anything. But until they know that I'm going to keep that confidential, or that when they confess something to me, I'm going to bring grace to them, it's not going to happen a lot. Right? There's another important thing that it also communicates, not only to your kids, but to you, 
would be that you're not perfect and that's okay. So there's this weird sense among, not just among parents, but Christians in general, we always have to pretend like we never do anything wrong. And it usually has the opposite effect that we want, right? Um, it usually, like, I can't tell you how many times, and this is because I'm a pastor's kid, I would date somebody or be friends with somebody who felt like they weren't good enough to be in a relationship with me because I, I'm like a holy person. I'm like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, you're, you're not talking to the right people. Talk to my brother or my dad or my mom. I'm not a holy person in the sense that you're thinking, right? And you definitely don't want to give that impression to your kids either. Because then they won't talk about that stuff. Because they don't know what the forgiveness is like. They think that the Christian life is one of like pretending. Because on some level, everybody knows it's pretending. That you're like, oh, I'm a great person. I got everything all together. I never have any problems. When we do have problems, it's always somebody else's fault. Right, on some level, they get that, right? So that's just sort of an example of the importance of the vocation of the parent because not just because of the formal church stuff, but your everyday life is connected to your spiritual life. They're not two separate things. They're one and the same. And you're always teaching stuff. And the reason that I highlight that as well is that by not participating in any of those things, you're also teaching something. So there's no neutral spot. So that's what our culture tries to convince us about the fourth commandment. Is that it's no big deal. Like one of the things I heard all the time growing up from my friends and their parents was, well, you know, I don't want to influence my children's choice about this. I want them to make their own decisions. You, you are, by definition of who you are to them, influencing their decisions. There's no spot where you can stand where you're not influencing their decisions and you're not teaching them something about like central about life, right? So if you, if your kids are wondering questions about sexuality or what's truth or whatever it may be that's being prompted by the world and you step back, what are you teaching them? Don't come to me with this stuff. I don't know the answers. Or if I do, I don't want to tell you, right? That's teaching something. It's not a neutral thing. Right? And, and in, in the context of the fourth commandment and the vocation of parenthood, that would be a sin. Because God has placed you to be that person for them. So effectively what's happening when that occurs is you're just abdicating the call that God has placed in your life. Right? Uh, <clears throat> it would be like me showing up on a Sunday morning and saying, I don't really want to preach today. Because I don't want to influence your thoughts on this particular issue. Is that a neutral thing for me to do? <laughs> Certainly not, right? And it would be irresponsible of me, not because I'm a super important person, like in and of myself, but because I have a job, a call from God that he wants me to do. It's the same with mom and dad. Right. Um, so parents know this verse or this commandment because... It is important to draw that connection between what you do as parents and where it comes from and the purpose that it, that it has. Because um, one of the main things that many of my friends who grew up in the church and then fell away from the church would say to me is, well, Jesus didn't really have anything to do with my life. And at first I was just like, what are you talking about? He's, got, he, he's, got, he's connected to everything. But as I got older, I realized the only reason I thought that way is because my parents helped me make that connection. Like if I got in a fight with somebody at school or I misbehaved at church, we were having a faith conversation about that. And the way that I behaved incorrectly was always drawn back to the law of God. And then the forgiveness that I received as a result of behaving incorrectly and being repentant and sorry about that was connected to Jesus. And that stuff happens all the time. How many times do your kids grow up? How many times do you grow up? Every day, right? So just think of those as, those are everyday opportunities to bring the gospel into your life and the lives of your children. Can I say something? Yeah. Uh, and I think it's important, and I'm just coming to the realization that I'm a parent, uh, to three daughters, um, 
and this commandment obviously applies, but I also, um, in realizing that I'm also a child and the commandment applies to me with my parents and we have to remember it in that way as well as grown adults. Um, yeah, so the point was made that, you know, when you're a parent with children who live at home or maybe they're in college or they're grown, uh, if your parents are still living on this earth, this commandment still applies to you in, as in the vocation of child, right? Um, and that's, that's exactly right. Now, some of you may be thinking, and you'd be correct to think, doesn't the vocational responsibility change as time goes on? Um, and Kristen sort of highlighted this a little bit in her example. Uh, the, your role as a parent is very different to a three-year-old than a 17-year-old. The basic orientation of guiding them to Jesus through word and sacrament doesn't change, but the ways in which that occurs does. <coughs> so that's important to realize that. Um, and some parents have a difficult time with that, uh, where like when your kids go off to college, you can't call them on the phone and say, you have to do this, this, and this. How's that going to turn out for you? Not really good, right? Because they're supposedly adults, and you've been telling them that they're now adults. But then when you, <clears throat> when you call them on the phone and treat them like a child, usually doesn't go well. right? And, and then you sort of, you're transitioning into a new role with that stuff, right? Counselor, advisor, backboard, etc. Um, now, they should still be obedient to you, but the role in which you're playing in their life as far as direct obedience goes is, is changing a bit more, <coughs> excuse me, a bit differently. I need to drink some of my coffee just a second. Okay, thank you. All right. Oh, and, and just so you know, I put two commandments on each one of these so we don't run out of stuff, but I usually am not anticipating getting through everything. So just just so you have that and you can keep those. Um, okay. Well, I'd be remiss if uh, we're doing a Bible study and we don't open the Bible. So let's look at a couple passages here. Um, so let's see. Rob, can you look up Ephesians 6, 1 to 4? Actually, I already have Oh, Cheryl's got that. Uh, can you look up the Romans 13, 1 and 2? And uh, Russ, can you look up Acts 5, 27 to 29? Ready? Good read, sure. I'll read. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may go well with you, and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. All right. So, uh, parents, I want to circle that one. But don't forget the last verse as well. Right? Um, it isn't just, hey, look, kids, God says you have to listen to me. It's also God has some specific responsibilities for you as well. Don't exasperate your children, but bring them up in the ways of the Lord. Okay, Romans 13. Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who, 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 he who rebels against authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. And those who do so will bring judgment on themselves. All right, so uh, important to highlight, we were focusing on the parental authority here, but this verse is really by extension of the parental authority about earthly authorities, period. So we include governing authorities and, and societal authority, like your teacher in a classroom, your professor at school, etc. cetera. Um, so he's highlighting there that connection we talked about already, that all of those, those earthly authorities derive their authority from God, okay? Now, what's the exception to listening to them? There's, there's one exception. Yeah, when they say, when they're trying to get you basically to do something against the authority that, that is the source of their authority, they're doing something against God's will. Very good. All right, Acts 5. And when they had brought them, they sent them for the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Do not you think you 
not the future of the AIDS and look at the situation that we've got here and we put this fear of blood on us. We need to get our apostle gifts and says we ought to obey God rather than men. All right, so if you've been looking for that, we ought to obey God rather than men verse in the Bible. It's there in Acts 5. And that's uh, an example highlighting when the earthly authority steps outside of their bounds and tries to ascribe things which God does not give it, which really in this case is actually against God himself, then we follow the example of the apostles and say, well, my number one obligation is to follow the will of God, not the will of man. Okay. That, I, I think that that's, you could have a whole study on what that actually means, yes. because that's sort of a loophole for everybody to do anything. Right, to, to justify lots of different lots of different things. Yes. So the point was made that, that we could do a whole study on just Acts 5 uh, because it's a severely misapplied passage or has a lot of potential to be misapplied, which is true. But that would then go back to the importance of knowing what is what is establishing the authority for your belief. Right? So for us, we're guided by the scriptures. So with the scriptures can clearly, it doesn't always lead to everything, so there's still the potential for some confusion here, but it helps us, at least in a lot of major ways, avoid that pitfall, right? That I can't say, well, you know, it's against God's law because uh, I, I'm not going to listen to you or I'm going to rebel against you because I don't like you. Well, sorry, according to scripture, that's not a sufficient reason. Um, so even if you have a personal animosity towards the president of the United States or your particular representative or whatever, that isn't a reason enough to want to rebel against them or appeal. Or, or, or as kids like to say, it's not fair, right? What about that? <laughs> <laughs> it's not fair. Yeah, that's right. Um, well, then you have to figure out where you're getting your definition of fair from, which for us is the scriptures. And so um, I, I can give you a good response to that, though, as a parent. Um, you say, yeah, we should be thanking God it's not fair. Otherwise, we would be in big time trouble because the gospel is not fair. Right? That's the whole point of the gospel. Yeah. Right. You know, you can have situations where a husband or a wife would die, where they're divorced, and another spouse person comes in. And that could cause a lot of complications. Where if the person really isn't, if the parent really isn't a good Christian that the person married, they're trying to talk to the kids, and I can see where families really have a lot of problems in those situations. Right, yeah, right, yeah, so the uh, the point that Ron made is that there are situations where due to different uh, varying broken situations in families, you can have somebody come in who is not a Christian who wants to speak to the kids in a way that isn't reflective of your own, your own beliefs, uh, which is true um, and, and very real. But it's also, we've made a bit of a mess of that on the church side of things over the last century or so, because we haven't taught very well, like, pre-marriage stuff regarding faith. That really, the Bible only says two things in particular about marriage as far as, like, requirements go. That it's between one man and one woman, and that you're not unequally yoked. And that's in direct reference to faith. Uh, the Bible does talk about the New Testament that if you're already married when you become a Christian and your spouse is not a Christian, then by your faithful witness, they may become. But uh, it's in Joshua. This, this, uh, this sort of blows my mind. This will be the last thing I share because I think we're running out of time. But in Joshua chapter 2, the Lord gave a commandment for his people when they're coming into the promised land, don't intermarry with the Canaanites. And he, and he specifically says the reason I don't should do that is that in very in a very short amount of time, you will forget about me. And did they listen to God? They didn't. And in Joshua chapter 2, it says this, and this, this is what blows my mind, that within two generations of Moses, so these are Moses' grandkids, no one knew of what God had done in Egypt. That's crazy. All right, so... That doesn't mean uh, that you treat them horribly, but you have to understand the, the deeply spiritual nature of marriage. And the church, I would say, has not done a very good job of preparing parents and then their kids through that uh, preparation to really understanding the level of value they should place on their partner's faith. Right? Um, and 
you know, that should be um, a bigger part of that discussion than it has been for the reasons you're describing, right? Um, because it really is a difficult thing to deal with and something that you're going to be dealing with the rest of your life if you don't do that. So, okay. That's it for today. Um, we will pick up with uh, the end of the fourth commandment and the beginning of the fifth commandment next week. Um, as usual, I just want to say another reminder again, if anything comes up that you have particular questions about, maybe you don't feel comfortable sharing them publicly in the class, email me or give me a call and I'll make sure to include them either in these lessons or once coming up. So, uh, let's close with a quick word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the earthly authorities that you've placed into our lives. Um, most especially, Lord, we thank you for the gift of parents. Um, and the, as they are your representatives to us in our lives, we ask that you encourage them, empower them by the grace of the gospel to carry out the vocation that you've given them so that their children may know you and that by the grace of your Holy Spirit, be granted the gift of lifelong faith through the hearing of your word and the receiving of your gifts. Uh, be with us as a congregation as we seek to follow your will with this commandment so that we may be a positive part of that process, that, you, uh, that your kingdom is built up for the next generation and their children and their children's children until you come again to make all things new. Uh, be with all the people in this class this week. Bless their uh, days until we come and gather again next week to receive your gifts and study your word. All these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, guys.